Ulster University Economic Policy Centre. So Richard's going to give us a few, some of the things that he's exploring around what's going to happen with the economy, how do we get out of this, and what are some of the medications in the short, medium and long term. So Richard, over to you. Thanks again. Hey, thank you, Kirsty. So thank you for the opportunity to present here this morning in the webinar. So hopefully you find the content useful and interesting. So Chelsea, if you can just flick on a couple of slides there, please. Okay, so primarily, as we all know, this is a humanitarian crisis. So um, there are 2.8 million cases across the globe and about 200,000 deaths so far. It emerged in Asia, but has transmitted across the globe. Um, and as you can see from the, the charts, Europe and the US are now gripped by the pandemic. Um, naturally, there are issues with recording, such as deaths that are recorded in or out of hospitals, primary causes of death, comorbidities, and of course, the challenge of um, gathering evidence across the developing world. So these are the best current estimates available. But as you can see, um, it's a global uh, crisis that has affected all countries across the world. Okay. If you can just flick on, please, Chelsea. Thank you. So the crisis, as you can see, is ongoing. So with the spread of COVID is viewed by country over time, it's pretty clear that a lot of the countries are now flattening the curve as, trans, as the lockdown measures have an impact on transmission. However, if we look at where the UK and Ireland are, as well as our main trading partners, it is clear that this is an ongoing crisis and we will have to prepare ourselves for a number of more months um, during this first phase of the pandemic. So here you can see that thankfully, Northern Ireland has recorded a lower number of deaths than other parts of the UK and fewer uh, deaths than were estimated at the start of the crisis. So it certainly is a tragedy in human terms and the economic shutdown is a second order implication, um, but that's really what I'm gonna focus on here today. So this is quite a peculiar recession um, as we move to focus on the impact. Um, we should note that this has been caused by policy choices made by government to save lives rather than being caused by a traditional recession uh, through a stock market crash, a financial system failure, oil crisis, or a post-war spending readjustment. Those are traditionally the causes of uh, recessions in the past, but this one is particularly different. It's been a relatively deep and rapid contraction here, as you can see. This is a chart from the Office of Budget Responsibility, and it shows that they expect the economy to contract by about 13% over the year during 2020. They expect a V-shaped uh, recovery, so quite a deep spike and a quick recovery, and about 17% growth during 2021. So they expect the UK to recover a lot of lo lost ground at that point. It's worth saying that most estimates are between minus five and minus 13% for 2020 across the UK. And so these are difficult times for many. Okay. Sorry. Um, investors, if we survey investors, the Bank of America has looked at what global fund managers expect, and the OVR perspective is one in that V-shaped recession. But as you can see, um, the fund managers expect the recession across the globe to be more U-shaped or W-shaped than V-shaped, so perhaps a more drawn-out recovery than the OVR might expect. The Bank of England has also warned of scarring effects, so as people become unemployed, they'll find it difficult to get back into work. Um, and that's especially those who don't have that many digital skills in a more automated environment. Okay. And as you can see here, the UK um, output index, the PMI, has plummeted um, to around 12.9. Uh, so that's the lowest in terms of the history of the index. Services activity has plummeted more than manufacturing, down to uh, 32 in manufacturing. 12 for services. So that's a very, very sharp um, and very significant decline. In context, you can see 2008, which was significantly less um, deep than 2020. Here, if we look at um, the business output for Northern Ireland, um, this is the UK P or the NI PMI index. It's published by the Ulster Bank and Richard Ramsey. We should note that this data is for March 2020. We only have, say, half a month of information when COVID had an impact on the Northern Ireland economy. April data will be published about the 11th of May, 
and it's expected that Northern Ireland will show a further deep contraction in line with the UK average. So unfortunately, the NI economy has moved from record highs in employment and record lows in unemployment in recent months, which were driving wage growth, to pretty much the sharpest contraction in NI's economic history. And this in turn will impact the markets across Northern Ireland. Okay. And here we have uh, one of the scenarios that we have produced in EPC for the economic impact of, of COVID-19 in terms of output. So GDP or output or wages plus profits is effectively what we're looking at here. So the economic policy centers contraction is for about minus 9.6 during 2020. EY have produced two scenarios from minus 6.7 to minus 10% for 2020. So they're reasonably consistent in, in their estimates. But what you can see is that in 2008, it took a number of years for the recession to fully unfold. Um, this recession has unfolded in, in a couple of weeks within one quarter. It's worth noting here that consumption makes up about 65% of the Northern Ireland economy. And that's where expenditure is expected to reduce most. Um, we have a reasonably large government sector in comparison to other economies. Um, and COVID-19 funding to the Northern Ireland executive is now in excess of 1 billion which represents about a 5% addition to departmental and annually managed expenditure in Northern Ireland. So a bit of a government boost in expenditure, but a significant, a very significant decline in consumption. Okay. One of the issues that we face as economists is that um, it takes a number of months to carry out official surveys and get data published. So at this point in time, we're really dealing with um, a range of surveys that have been published by business um, organizations such as the Belfast Chamber, NI Chamber of Commerce, Manufacturing NI, and Construction Employers Federation. And what those surveys say is that across the board, um, all types of firms are finding this particularly difficult. So three out of four firms highlight a serious decline in sales and income. 38% um, have seen a decrease in the size of the workforce. About half have laid off contractors or agency workers. 28% of construction firms have made redundancies and half expect to do more of this in the next three months. In terms of furlough, the job retention scheme, 80% are likely to furlough some staff and 30% are likely to furlough all staff. In the construction industry, all firms surveyed said that they would furlough their staff and about four in every five manufacturing firms will do the same. So quite significant impacts reported across the surveys. Okay. In terms of cash reserves, that's how companies are funding um, their cash, their, their wage bills and um, commitments during this recession until they get the, the uh, money back through CBIL, another scheme by the UK government. Um, so one in 10 currently have no cash reserves. That's quite a precarious situation. About two thirds have three months of cash remaining and four out of five manufacturers are already using their cash reserves. In terms of repurposing, it's good to note that about 12% of manufacturers are now working collaboratively with the NHS and about one in seven have made changes to their product or service um, and moved online. So I had expected that more companies would move online quite quickly. Okay. And this chart is inspired by the Resolution Foundation, one of their charts, and it's replicated for Northern Ireland. And what that shows is the April 2020 positions. So the blue bars along the bottom uh, that are combined are the unemployment numbers. Um, and we expect probably 20, 30, 35,000 additional um, universal claimant, um, claimants to join the unemployment register. If we also look at the estimates of furloughed workers, about 235,000 is what EPC have estimated. If we add these together, you can get the, an impression for how significant um, the impact has been across the labour market. The job retention scheme is with my president. Um, the objective here is to keep people in, in employment and out of unemployment, um, and that reduces cost to firms then if they have to come and rehire uh, workers, and it certainly reduces unemployment then as people struggle to get back into work. One good thing is that it's focused on the lower paying sectors, um, so things like tourism, um, hotels, restaurants and hospitality. Um, where generally people would be the most heavily impacted. So it does support households um, and incomes. Okay. And if we look here at the distributional impacts, it's clear that the most vulnerable and lowest paid in society 
um, are likely to be those who are most impacted by the recession. So the young, those in precarious employment, those with low levels of formal qualification, um, those who can't work from home or are not technologically adept, are the groups that are likely to be impacted most negatively and need government support. So here the chart shows that those who are lowest paid um, are likely to have either lost their job or be in furlough. Sub-regional perspective is interesting. So if you look across the 11 council areas in Northern Ireland, the Centre for Progressive Policy has looked at the, um, and this is actually the number of or the reduction in GVA um, across the council area. So as you'll see, the, the local economies with strong manufacturing bases um, and a tourism bases are likely to be most impacted. Those with a large public sector or high tech uh, professional services are less so. Mid Ulster in particular um, has a successful manufacturing company base and a lot of construction workers and has been hit um, quite significantly by the downturn. Darien Straban is least impacted. Um, in, it's ranked 363 of the 382 local areas. Um, and it is an area that requires growth to catch up to Northern Ireland average levels, but it is probably less impacted than other areas. Uh, Mid Ulster ranks about seventh out of the 382 local areas in terms of the impacts, which is a significantly impacted area. In contrast to that, um, people who are working from home are doing so in many cases, and therefore the contrast is that many jobs are already being carried out to a large extent in the sub regions, which proves that remote working can deliver and bring benefits, including reduced congestion and reductions in pollution. Okay. And if we move on to the environmental impacts, these are positive in terms of carbon emissions. So as we have reduced our use of all forms of mechanized travel, uh, air quality has improved and there's fewer uh, CO2 and carbon monoxide emissions. On the flip side of that, in terms of energy use through data centers and online um, activity, and then through packaged food um, and packaged uh, components through online orders, we've probably increased the use of certain uh, energy sources um, and waste, uh, so that partially offsets the carbon emissions. Okay. And if we now look at the government support um, to try and ameliorate the impact of the coronavirus crisis, it's clear here that there's been an unprecedented government intervention. So in the UK, it's worth about 20% of GVA. UK was forecast to borrow about 2.4% of GDP this year to fund public services, and that's expected to increase to about 8.8%. So you can see here that government around the world have spared very little in terms of dealing with the crisis. European state aid rules and fiscal rules have been suspended um, as various uh, lockdown measures have halted or disrupted economic activity. So we have the immediate fiscal response, which is the blue bar. So that's additional spending um, foregone revenues in terms of taxes um, and those are the immediate impacts which will actually deteriorate the government's balance sheet. The deferrals then look at certain payments so taxes, um, BAT income tax which can be deferred into a later year which improve liquidity for companies but um, that damages the government balance sheet in the short term and then the um, other liquidity guarantees are things like export guarantees, liquidity assistance and then support through say, central banks as well. So significant in that 20% of output um, is now being devoted entirely to the coronavirus crisis. Okay. And here's just a quick overview of the policies that are in place. And I know some on the webinar will cover these in more detail later. Those in bold are the NI specific schemes that have been launched by the executive. So the grant for all small NAV rate pairs and the 25K grant for those in retail, hospitality and tourism. There's also sports and hard, sports hardship funds, and then there are discussions about an NI hardship fund, which hopefully will launch this week. So there are a range of supports available. They have necessarily been um, blanket supports and launched very quickly, um, because it's difficult to tailor policies significantly at this point in time um, and do that very quickly. Okay. Now, whilst times are tough, um, I think now that society understands the significance of the pandemic and people are, for the most part, doing their bit, um, I think now we have to look at how we may return safely to work where possible and how society could lift some sectoral restrictions and how we would help those businesses um, who did not survive or potentially those who have lost their jobs. It might be still some way off, but it is worth 
beginning to plan now um, before we get to that point. So questions are, in terms of people, where would we be comfortable going? So garden centres, um, plenty of social distancing, not much trouble. Hairdressers or barbers, um, essential services, those sorts of things. But beauty salons and gyms, pubs and bars, um, people are less comfortable going to those. And I think social distancing will be an issue that will be a factor for employers and employees as we begin to work out how we can return to work. Okay. And as we look at our readiness to return and restart economies, um, the continual assessment of the transmission of the virus and public health system readiness is going to be required. So this is a graphic from McKinsey. And the, the assessment is that the UK is on the top left and the NI is on the top left of the, the graphic. Um, so we still have a low system readiness, but we have been able to reduce the spread of the virus initially. So whilst it's less severe in Northern Ireland than initial estimates, it will take some time to emerge from the crisis and potentially a number of years to recover lost ground. Okay. And as we begin to round up, I think it's very clear that there's been a, a big gun response to the pandemic. So there have been significant impacts across the world. Um, the most significant pandemic to hit the world since the Spanish flu. The policy lockdown has been necessary and rapid um, in terms of parts of the economy and individual freedoms, in terms of saving lives and reducing transmission of the virus. It has brought grief to many families, but thankfully the NI impact has been less than initial estimates. So I think when we look at the curves that are um, available in terms of flattening the overall curve, we can expect restrictions on the economy and individuals to be in place for a number more months and then taper down. As I said, these interventions have been broad ranging, immediate, expensive, but very necessary um, in terms of ameliorating the immediate impacts of the recession and keeping people in employment rather than unemployment. Okay. It's been a very, very sharp recession and it's probably the sharpest in Northern Ireland's history. And I think what it's going to do is accelerate a range of trends that were already underway within Northern Ireland. So there will be a move to more online commerce. We've got used to that. Um, I think people will be more comfortable buying stuff online and they'll move again further away from the high street. It will speed automation and digitization of how we work and learn and all those sorts of things. Um, it'll be more normal to work from home. It will be less normal then to have to commute into a congested city centre. And there are all sorts of implications there for commercial activity, um, rents, roads policies, all of those sorts of things. The composition of the high street was changing in recent years, and I think this will accelerate how the high street will change over the next couple of years. Um, Physical-based re retailing, um, with the exception it'll be non-food retailing, I think may struggle in the high street in the next number of years. We'll also potentially val value some of the environmental impacts much more highly. So how we cost carbon, how we cost the um, nitrous oxide, how we cost all of those negative impacts on the environment, I think will feature into our decisions in terms of how we actually value and work out what projects we're going to take forward. It's pretty clear at this point that their impacts will be uneven across society. And there are vulnerable groups that will need additional support. So those with limited digital skills, those with online limited online access, those who are lower qualified, the young who haven't yet got into um, employment or into the job that they had to aim to get into, and then those areas that geographically rely on tourism or on a manufacturing base. So there are certainly areas where vulnerable individuals will need support, and we need to be careful in terms of policy that um, a number of people can fall through the cracks. Okay. And then the question for us as a society then will be, how do we raise and spend our public monies? So will there be a different social contract between individuals and government? And I think at this stage, it's clear that um, government will be required to do more in terms of protecting citizens and being able to mobilize at speed when required. So taxation, as I th said, probably a greater focus on taxing environmental costs and spending more on healthcare, resilience, and on security. How we work and learn, I think as somebody who works in a university setting, we'll need to be present in the office um, slightly less, but present online quite a bit more. And there's also a blurring of working hours between um, home and home work boundaries. How we support businesses, um, and certainly in a post-July environment in Northern Ireland, what is the version two of the rates 
um, and grant system. So the hardship fund that hopefully will be announced this week um, is being discussed by the executive um, and rate support then more targeted rate support post July. So we have a bit of time to design that system and then hopefully that will focus on the areas that are, that are most vulnerable. There's also going to be a focus on increasing financial resilience amongst businesses and probably amongst individuals. We're quite heavily indebted in Northern Ireland in relation to other areas. Shorter, more local supply chains will be more in vogue. And then also in terms of digital survivors, how are we going to help them thrive and help them grow? Um, and this, uh, They'll hopefully then take the place of some of the other businesses that maybe haven't survived. How we help developing leaders, how we help them thrive and learn in a crisis, and how we um, help them, executives and non-executives, uh, lead at a time of crisis. In terms of community focus, I think there has been a, an increase in community focus, which is good. Um, and then over the next number of years, can we retain that in Northern Ireland um, and work together? So in closing, I'd like to say that there are many serious costs and challenges to the government, those who make and implement policy, and certainly for individuals. There are plenty of terribly sad stories around at the minute um, about people that have been affected and families. However, there are positives, and if we can work to improve the environments, sit for fewer hours in congested traffic, manage our working hours or look after those who are most in need in society and in the business sense. I think that if society grasps those opportunities, then things could be potentially improved in the future. So thank you for listening. I hope you find that presentation uh, useful, even if it's quite concerning in parts, and I'm happy to take questions. Richard, thank you very much. That was very useful indeed. And I know you're advising government at various levels on some of those interventions. So it's good to kind of get that view from you. Um, Chelsea, if I can ask you to stop recording.